Thanks for watching Enabling IT Modernization, Creating a Platform for Transformation, presented by CenturyLink. I'm Francis Rose with the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. In this special program, we'll cover IT modernization as a key pillar of the President's management agenda, some success stories in IT modernization from individual agencies, acquisitions role in that effort, and some private sector practices that could help make transformation possible. I'll be joined by IT leaders from the Office of Management and Budget, the Justice and Education Departments, and some of their counterparts in the private sector. It's an important topic and a great lineup, so let's get right to it. Joining me first, Margie Graves, the Federal Deputy Chief Information Officer, and David Young, Senior Vice President of Strategic Government at CenturyLink. Thanks both very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Margie, I want to start with you. Tell me about the infrastructure blockers that you and your colleagues at OMB are working on to help agencies implement the IT modernization parts of the President's management agenda. That's a great question. Um, you know, I basically think that we have shown the direction from this administration uh, that has set the tone for how we're going to move out on IT modernization. First of all, you see it reflected in the executive order and the IT modernization report, which tells us to adopt cloud services. It also emphasizes commercial approaches. It also brings in the aspect of cybersecurity. And ultimately, uh, what it does is it says we're going to move out in a very rapid fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, then you see that reflected in the President's management agenda in the following ways. IT modernization is one of the key pillars. It's supported by data as a strategic asset and also the IT workforce of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So when you pull all of those three elements together, you have the combination that you need in order to achieve success. The President's management agenda also emphasizes that IT modernization has uh, policies that support it and in the office of the federal CIO we are changing our policies to allow rapid adoption of cloud technologies and in order to do that we have to address some of the uh, strategic aspects of the way policy has been uh, promulgated in the past including the changes in technology that have occurred in that time frame and making sure that every policy that we change supports agencies in their adoption of those technologies. So for example, you'll see that we are changing the way that we look at security and the cloud. Uh, you will see several agencies that are participating with us on um, what I would consider to be pilot projects on how you would use the trusted internet connection and how you would promulgate security in the cloud mm -hmm. and that situation. One of the things that I think is striking about the PMA is not just the listing of here are the technologies that we endorse for moving forward, but it's all done with a similar goal to what you worked on with Tony Scott as the mm -hmm. deputy CIO under him, which is the point of this is not IT. The point of this is better service to the citizen, and IT is a methodology to delivering that. Am I reading it right? That is correct. IT and technology is an enabler of the transformation itself. Transformation is inclusive of looking at the way you deliver those goods and services to the American public, recognizing that they expect to receive them in the same manner that they receive their banking applications or any other kind of service that they would receive in the private sector. And why shouldn't they? Should They should expect to interact with their federal government in the same manner. Mm -hmm. And to that end, we need to make sure that we are looking at uh, transforming our business processes and deciding how we use data and determining how the customer expects us to interact with them. And that's including them in the equation in user experience as we're developing. It's also important that we manage to, um, uh, to infuse this with the, uh, the back and forth that's necessary for them to give us feedback on what we're delivering along the way, and that includes uh, constant interaction and, um, and embedding them in the process. David, I noticed you were nodding your head enthusiastically as I was talking about IT being an enabler to better citizen services rather than uh, a means to its own end. Why do you think that's so important, and how does that thinking maybe 
inform the way that agencies should look at their IT transformation efforts? So that, that's a great question, and, and IT being a, a driver in the modernization effort, <clears throat> um, it becomes very critical, not only uh, to the tools uh, that the government is going to bring to bear uh, for agencies to, to have at their wherewithal to be able to design how they interact with constituents and the public, um, but it also has another tie too, and that is the recruitment of talent into the government agencies. If the commercial industry is moving, say, in a call center world where it's very dispersed, uh, people potentially working from home, the technology exists to allow management to understand what's happening in the flows. It doesn't all have to be under the same roof. How do you attract those pieces of talent into the government that are best in breed? So I think the, the opportunity we have now from an industry and from a government perspective is to really transform how people interact with the government, but how the government hires and recruits talent as well. Mm -hmm. The challenge to that is processes that were not really put in place for a 21st century workforce. We'll talk later on the program if we have an opportunity mm -hmm. about that issue. But identifying the people who have those skills, it potentially it seems for both industry people like you who are partnering with government and for the government themselves to be one of the biggest challenges in the economy that we live in today. It, it, it sure is. Um, and the cycles that, that we operate on the enterprise side of business versus government side, it, they buy all the same, government buys all the same products and services. They put them together in very similar ways. The difference, I like to explain to people, the difference is around the procurement strategy that's used to obtain those products and services. And I think that's the biggest thing when we work inside our own enterprises and explain to our corporations what the cycles that we're going through. That's the number one thing that we spend time on is talking about the procurement cycle and the importance of being able to participate through that entire life cycle of interaction not just wait until an RFP shows up, but to be sharing mind share, to be sharing thoughts around how challenges are solved together before decisions are made about what's going to show up in RFP. It's too hard to influence uh, perspective and alternatives when you're at that point in the procurement. Margie, I want to come back to this idea, the, to the strategy that you and your colleagues have built for agencies moving forward. One key piece of it is the centers of excellence that the General Services Administration houses. I'm fascinated by this concept because it, it strikes me as something that's different than what government has done before. When an agency first approaches that relationship where they're partnering with GSA and working with your team on working through the centers of excellence, what can the agencies expect to see? What resources can they expect to be able to leverage? We have a great lineup of technical talent as well as acquisition support that exists within the GSA COEs. Uh, they can be applied to looking at your architecture, to strategizing with you as to how you would rationalize your IT portfolio, to determine how to sequence your modernization initiatives, and to develop that all-important roadmap, which every agency should be developing at this point, because this is not a year process, this is a multi-year process. We would have expectations that GSA would work with those agencies as they move through that process and be able to provide technical assistance and also they're sitting side by side with the talent that we have within our federal staffs and our contractors that support us to be able to really move the needle. You said something recently that I thought was really instructive and uh, that I discussed with Susan Kent when she was on, uh, Suzette Kent when she was on Government Matters recently and that is that if it's done right IT modernization never really ends, does it? This is something that agencies should expect to be an ongoing process moving forward as the trajectory of technology changes and as the possibilities that technology permits for those citizen services changes. That's absolutely correct. You would never in the private sector rest on your laurels and not be constantly reinventing yourself or you would not be resident in the market very long. So we should have the expectation for our agencies to be continuously reinventing themselves. And as new technologies come to the fore, embrace that, look out far enough on the horizon to determine how those technologies might be incorporated into the way you deliver your mission space, and then put that on your roadmap. So we're constantly refreshing. There's no room here to set it and forget it. Uh, those kinds of approaches never work. Uh, they put you in some of the positions we are in today where there are a lot of existing legacy systems and embedded infrastructure that no longer works and delivers the mission in an effective manner. Margie, David, thank you both very much. Thank you.
Up next, you'll hear from a pair of agency-level chief information officers about their modernization stories and collaboration across leadership positions. You're watching Enabling IT Modernization on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Keep it right here. Enabling IT Modernization, creating a platform for transformation, is brought to you by CenturyLink. Your link to what's next. Learn more at CenturyLink.com. Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. on News Channel 8, and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on ABC7. So far, we've covered the importance of IT modernization as the president's management agenda outlines and how that driver of transformation could impact the federal workforce as a whole. Now let's get a more granular look at execution and collaboration from a pair of agency chief information officers. Joining me now, Jason Gray, the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Education, and Carl Mathias, the CIO at the U.S. Marshals Service. Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming on. We were talking before we went on the air, Jason. This is a terrific time to be in information technology in the federal government for a lot of reasons. What are the, some of the most important reasons to you? Well, one of the key things for me is with the President's Management Agenda, it really uh, touches on three specific areas that any IT professional can relate with whether it's the IT modernization, the data, you know, accountability and transparency, or, and then the workforce. So to me, it, it really helps support everything that we are doing uh, in technology. It's striking, too, that in many cases, it's supporting and giving cover for things that people like you and others in government were already doing. It just kind of codifies them. It puts them into formal practice and thereby gives you the cover that you need as you're working with your CXOs across government. Absolutely. One thing I really, as the co-chair for the CIO Council Workforce Committee, the workforce reform, you know, with the recruiting, retaining, reskilling, that has been really a, a very powerful um, document to have, an agenda to have to help support what we're doing. Carl, you have undertaken a number of agile development uh, efforts and so on. A lot of the things that are key components of the PMA and so on. One of the things that I think is really interesting about what you're doing is via vis-a-vis uh, -vis this focus on customer service. I read that you have deputies embedded in your agile development teams so that your developers are talking to your customers on an ongoing basis. How did you come up with that idea and what kind of payoffs have you seen so far? So um, I, I would love to tell you it was an original idea of the Marshalls, <laughs> but the reality is that's, that's the nature of Agile itself that you should have your customers embedded into your team. So we have several scrum teams sitting over there working on the modernization of our warrant system, prisoner tracking system, uh, and their job is to be the product owner. Uh, that is literally their titles. And so they own individual parts of the product and they guide that team to say, this is what we need in the field. And as they go through these three week sprints, uh, the, you know, during the sprint and through each sprint, each new product comes out. They're okaying it. They're saying, this is good, that's not good. But we take it a step further. Uh, after we do interim releases internally, we take it to the field. We go to the districts and we show different districts what this looks like to make sure those deputies who weren't involved do the sanity check to say, yeah, that will work for us or that won't work for us. You're maybe a little too humble in giving credit to other people for the Agile methodology because, I mean, we've all been doing this, you've been doing it, I've been covering it for a long time, and we all know how long it has been and how recently it's changed that it was throw requirements over the fence and the end user sees it after a waterfall process, turns it on and maybe it doesn't work, maybe it does work, and that's not the case at all, it sounds like, with what you're seeing. No, that is not the case, but it doesn't mean it's a perfect world either, okay? Part of the things you have to do when you go, in, go down this path is to educate your users on how different this process is, because many of them are used to that, throw it over the wall, we'll see you in a few years, hope it works. Uh, so it was very unusual for them to have us say, okay, you have to show up or you have to be embedded with us. And it was a cultural transformation to do that. 
But we had some serious success stories out of that, and uh, we're just shot like an electron through the workforce that, hey, there's a better way to do business, and the IT division and the U.S. Marshals has figured it out. Jason, uh, you heard Margie Graves talking about the president's management agenda and the vision that they laid out, what they wanted it to mean to you and your colleagues at the agency level. Sounds like from when you talked about how exciting a time it is to be in IT, you're seeing that, 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 that vision is fulfilled in the kind of the freedom and, and the cover that it's giving you. What's your biggest takeaway, do you think, from what Margie said and what you're experiencing with the PMA? I think the collaboration and the support that we've seen, uh, not only from OMB, but all agencies. I, I have never, I've been in government for quite a while, and I haven't seen the level of collaboration that I'm seeing today. Carl, you have the same opportunities for collaboration horizontally that Jason does at education. You have those within the Marshall Service. You also have them vertically in that you're a component of the Department of Justice. So you've got Joe Klimovich and his team right. at the CIO level at the agency to work with you as well. Does your collaboration picture look similar to what Jason's talking about, or is it different, maybe a little more complex because of the horizontal and vertical? I don't think it's more complex. Uh, I think it is a little different simply because there is a difference between how you uh, coordinate, cooperate at the department level versus, say, a component within a department level. But that doesn't mean we don't. And, and so I'll give you an example. The vertical uh, collaboration, uh, Joe has been fantastic about leading the effort of the department to move toward uh, mail in the cloud, in our case, Office 365. Tonight, I go over to Office 365. My, most of my staff is already there. Uh, I sent him a snarky note right before this interview saying, hey, if you don't hear from me uh, after tomorrow, <laughs> you know how that went. But I'm sure it, it, so far it's been fantastic. So he's providing the staff, the environment, everything to do that, which is, is wonderful. That's services at the department level. But across components, I'll give you an example, uh, ATF and the U.S. Marshals share a lot. Uh, for example, we share the same service desk uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, that collaboration reduced our customer wait times from at one point 17 minutes hanging on the phone to now we're well under two, hang around one minute to one and a half. Uh, we share the same VoIP system with the U.S. Attorney's offices. So, uh, you know, we find those uh, component level collaboration. What's great about the PMA uh, is that it gives us this backing of, yeah, you should be doing this. Carl, Jason, thanks both very much for joining me. I appreciate it. People often overlook the word acquisition as they discuss IT modernization. We won't make that mistake here. The former commissioner of GSA's Federal Acquisition Service joins me next. You're watching Enabling IT Modernization on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Stay with us. Enabling IT Modernization, Creating a Platform for Transformation, is brought to you by CenturyLink. Your link to what's next. Learn more at CenturyLink.com. Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. on News Channel 8, and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on ABC7. According to the president's management agenda, major acquisitions, $50 million or more, account for about a third of all federal contract spending. They're designed to transform areas of critical need. The problem is they fail often because of a process that can reward compliance over creativity. Jim Williams is partner at Shamback and Williams Consulting and former commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service, the General Services Administration. Jim, you, we've heard a lot of discussion already about IT modernization. In the context of your experience at GSA, where the centers of excellence now live, take away on what you've heard so far. Well, I think it's a unique point in time, and I think it's very cool. I'm a big fan of the President's Management Agenda, and what I like about it is it's really focused on delivering better service to the citizens modernize the IT, use the data, use the people, but do it with the mission in, in hand, which is look to provide better citizen services. And I, I think all parts of the President's management agenda work together. I like the key drivers, I like the, the cap goals, and the functional priority goals, too. The idea, though, of IT for customer service, for citizen services' sake, that's relatively new, that the focus on that has maybe only been within the last 
three, five years or so? I think you're right. And I think the focus on customer experience and human-centered design, customer-centric design. Charles Rosati did a great job with this at the IRS. They were, they were working that way in the VA. I think Sonny Perdue is doing it from the point of view of the farmers with his modernizing his infrastructure to allow for better services to the citizen. But I think that customer experience is a growing movement. For the agencies that are participating in the Technology Modernization Fund, What's the best way to maximize the money that they get? There's only $100 million in it. What's the best way to make the most of it? Well, obviously, to deliver. And they're looking for short-term increments to deliver functionality with security that also deliver those better citizen services. So how do you take that small amount of money and deliver in an increment that provides a platform, and that platform allows you to have the security, the focus on the citizen, and modernizing that technology in terms of meeting those two goals, secure and better delivery to the citizen. What would be the best way for them to make sure that they are paying the money back to perpetuate the fund? Again, it's to modernize that technology. And, and as people have talked about before, uh, bring the right people together to make sure that you can deliver in an agile way deliver something quickly that provides that return on investment, provides also savings so that they have money that they can then pay back. What, is the, what do the chief acquisition officers at the agencies need in order to be able to execute their piece of this? Well, I think that's a very important question that I haven't heard people being uh, asked that question. And what I'm talking about is you think about modernizing all of this legacy IT and doing it in a very collaborative, very fast way, very agile way, that's the right answer. That takes resources. But if you combine things like the enterprise infrastructure solutions, which is a, a unique point in time to modernize your infrastructure so you can better deliver those services, that takes time. And as Margie and Dave Young said, you know, doing this side by side in a collaborative manner with industry can speed things up. That takes resources. And if you think about this year, we've just had the money from this year's budget being released. It's a lot of money coming down, a lot of money that has to be spent between now and September 30th. The burden on those acquisition workforce to modernize EIT, to deal with EIS, which is an important piece of this, and, and spend the rest of that money wisely, I think people need to take a close look at, at from a deputy secretary level, do we have the people we need to make all this happen? Up next, industry's approach to IT modernization. We'll cover a long list of current contract vehicles, the transition to new ones, and how agencies can work with the private sector to cut costs, increase efficiency, and serve the taxpayer better. More of this special program, enabling IT modernization, right after this. Enabling IT modernization, creating a platform for transformation is brought to you by CenturyLink, your link to what's next. Learn more at CenturyLink.com. Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. on News Channel 8, and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on ABC7. So far, you've heard from the Federal Deputy Chief Information Officer about how OMB will push IT modernization. A pair of agency CIOs also shared some of their best practices. We also covered acquisition, an often overlooked but critical component to IT transformation. Now let's get some insight from the contracting side of the equation. Here again, David Young, Senior Vice President of Strategic Government at CenturyLink, and joining us to wrap things up, Shauna Gilliland, Vice President of Federal Program Management at CenturyLink. Shauna, I'll start with you. Your takeaway from what we've heard so far? You know, I think it's interesting to hear from the, the different agencies represented. Um, they talk about the complexity that comes with IT modernization. Um, it's not really more or less complex per agency, it's just different. Mm -hmm. And so their needs are different. And from that, the 
potentially the contract vehicles they need to use are different. And so I think it's important um, us as industry to realize that we need to come to the table with a lot of different avenues for agencies to achieve their IT modernization goals. I want to come back to that in a yeah. moment, but Dave, your takeaways? Yeah, I'll build on what Shauna says. I think um, working together ac across the, the marketplace is really important right now. Um, as we've seen the, the government pulling in the COE, the Center of Excellence, uh, we've seen interactions with uh, industry uh, very early in the cycle. I think all of those are building to uh, a big benefit for our country and big benefit for citizens and how they interact with government. I think it makes government a, a, a much better place uh, operationally and, and as well as serving the missions that they, they have, whether that's protecting the food supply or planes in the sky or somebody's son or daughter in harm's way. I think uh, it's a, a very unique place that we're in right now. You talked about the proliferation of contract vehicles when you were here with Margie Graves earlier in our program, and I wonder what your broader thought is about that now that you've heard from the two agency CIOs, you heard from Jim Williams, who was kind of one of the pioneers of, of the contract vehicles that exist today. What do you think about the way the landscape looks now? You know, I think that's, that's a good perspective because there is a portfolio of contracts. Uh, and understanding what's important around each and what each was designed for, I think GSA's vision is, is very clear on them. And there are areas that they, they overlap one another. I think uh, cyber is, is a place that it overlaps EIS Alliant. Um, but I think at the core right now, what's going to happen modernization-wise, it's all about EIS. In the next uh, 24, 36 months, as we see agencies uh, release their uh, desires either in a SOW or an SOO, uh, the industry replying back to that, and then we begin to build what it is that they've chosen. Uh, it's a re really a remarkable time uh, in our marketplace. Sean, a lot has been made of the way that GSA is kind of paving the way for this transition to EIS. What's the right role for a vendor to help an agency as they're working through the transition from your point of view? Well, it's really important for an agency to start with a quality inventory, and especially, you know, as incumbents, being able to help them ensure that they have a good view of, of what their current inventory is, because you need to know what you're starting from. But along with that, you know, agencies really need to think about what is their roadmap to modernization. They're not going to get there all at once, but what's the vision of what's it going to be, and how do they break it down into manageable increments to achieve that ultimate vision? You know, what are the pieces they need to have in place for for network, what are the security components they need to layer on? And just, again, having that roadmap um, so they can, can work towards it, I think is really important. Yeah, I'd like to build on that too. I think uh, what we see in industry is a transition plan. Mm -hmm. And a transition plan is really the next step post-award to move from one network platform to another, let's say. Um, I think that transition plan needs to be a little bit broader than that. It's about how we're going to introduce technology, how we're going to refresh technology, and understand how uh, the agency is going to live with the partner that they choose to provide those services. Understanding that aspect of the relationship, I think, would, would benefit everybody. Shauna, how will we look back on all of this at some point in the future? and judge whether, especially things like the transition to EIS, some of the technology modernization things that we've mm -hmm. talked about on this program have been successful. Is it just a matter of the program worked right and we hit on goal, under budget and all of that? Or are there other measures that we should really pay attention to, both on the government mm -hmm. side and on the industry side? You know, it's a good question. And I think the most important thing we can look at is the end user experience. So it's not an end user, not just for us in industry, the government customer, but the end user who's utilizing the service. You know, we talk about uh, statements of objectives, and I think that's a fantastic way to help, you know, making sure that government's coming along with where industry is. But sometimes what we miss in terms of measuring the success is the end user experience. You know, we measure on service levels, but are we measuring the right ones? Mm -hmm. And so I think there needs to be a lot of thought put in place about, again, that experience, and if we can get positive results from there, then I think we've been successful. Dave, about 30 seconds left. Uh, last word, uh, your measures for success? You know, I think to Sean's point, it's really about the, the constituents, the citizen. Um, we we'll make sure that the technology folks inside government working with us have those insights, make sure that we're asking the right questions when we're dealing with them about their customer and what their customer needs are. So sometimes we can get caught up around the technology. We need to keep that, that end user uh, in, in the forefront instead of the technology. David Young, Shauna Gilliland, thanks both very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching this special program, Enabling IT Modernization, Creating a Platform for Transformation, presented by CenturyLink. 
For more information on the subject matter we discussed today, go to govmatters.tv slash IT modernization. For the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network, I'm Francis Rose.